everyone can hear me, right? Hopefully. 10 4. Okay, cool. Alrighty. Hi, everyone. My name is Trinity, and I want to thank you for coming to our session tonight. And I'm just going to introduce our speaker and then hand it over to her and let her take it away. So Dr. Monica Verdusco Gutierrez is an accomplished academic physiatrist and professor at and distinguished chair of the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine at the Long School of Medicine at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. She is also the medical director for critical illness recovery and neuro rehabilitation at Warm Springs Rehabilitation Hospitals in San Antonio and chief of the physical medicine and rehabilitation services line at the University Health Hospital System. She is a fellow member of the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, as well as on the board of trustees of the Association of Academic Physiatrists. Dr. Gutierrez grew up in South Texas, then moved to Houston, where she earned her undergraduate degree at Rice University, her medical degree at Baylor College of Medicine, and completed her PM&R residency training in the Baylor College of Medicine, UT Houston Rehabilitation Alliance. Dr. Gutierrez excitedly moved to San Antonio to lead the Distinguished Department of Rehabilitation Medicine in 2020. Her area of clinical expertise is the care of patients with traumatic brain injury, stroke rehabilitation, interventional spasticity management, and now post-acute uh, squillet of SARS-CoV-2. During the COVID-19 pandemic, she has developed two post-COVID recovery clinics to aid in the rehabilitative recovery of patients with functional mobility and cognitive deficits after infection with COVID-19. She has over 100 publications in these areas, as well as topics related to health, equity, and inclusion. Thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be able to tell a little bit about me, about my story. One thing... Um, Yesterday, I spoke to our LMSA group. LMSA is Latin American Student Association at the medical school that I work at. So, you know, I started with, um, you know, telling a little bit about myself, but also telling a little bit about my field because it's something that I want for people who are pre meds to know about it. So, it could very much interest you when you go, if you want, end up going into medicine, going to medical school. You know, I really want people to be considering it as a profession. Also, I'm going to tell you today, I'm repping the tomorrow's the National Latinx Physician Day. So, I'm wearing my shirt today because I was at work all day. So, I'm going to wear it because two of my friends co founded that thing. Oh, nice. Michael and Cesar. Uh, yeah, great. Yes, I know. I was like, I ordered a shirt. I get it, got it sent to me so I could wear it and represent. And, you know, some of the numbers you've probably heard that, you know, Latinos make up 6% of all the physician workforce. And if you think that um, Hispanic community under the census is 18% uh, of the U.S. and in some states it's 50% in or almost getting towards 50% in Texas, it's now the majority of people. And so definitely not the majority of physicians. So, you know, very important to uh, get into the field. So I'm gonna share screen because I do have slides. <laughs> and what I call my unofficial title of my talk is uh, physical medicine and rehab and why I love my job. Um, and just a little bit more about me and what it's taken to get, get here. So personally, this, you know, specialty, I never heard of it before I went to medical school. I always feel like you can't, you can't be what you can't see. And kind of the only thing that I had saw and thought was my pediatrician growing up was a Latino and was so kind and wonderful. And I was like, oh, that's what I wanted to be. And then when I went through my medical school training, I, there were so many things that I liked. I liked the brain. I liked neurology. I liked rheumatology. I like orthopedics. I like sports, sports medicine and kind of my field that I in really combines all that together. Um, personally, I like fitness. I like running um, and learning about exercise, which a lot of part of physical medicine is. 
um, I care about the well-being of people. Hopefully, if you are going into medicine, you care about the well-being of people. But I really, you know, I'm interested in having long-term relationships with people. And then I like to also have good work-life balance, which is something that we get in physical medicine and rehab. So I like to tell people it's physical medicine and rehab with an ampersand, not some people will put N, like if it's a PMNR, but it's an and R. So physical medicine and rehabilitation, also called physiatry or physiatry, it kind of depends, people say a different way, or physiatrist. And it comes from like the Greek roots of physiokos, which means physical, and iatria, which is the act of healing or the art of healing. So it's using kind of physical ways so to heal patients, or it initially was that. Um, they say also joke that PM&R is plenty of money and relaxation. And um, I probably, that was a picture when my kids were little babies and, you know, relaxing. And um, in general, the medical field, especially when you're first generation, it's a lot of, it's good money because my family did not have that kind of money before. So yes, you know, going into medicine, being a physician, you're going to have a good job and you're going to make money, especially as a first generation. Um, and then relaxation is my call is not that bad. I get to have work-life balance. And, but I'm like, well, that's kind of a wishful thinking because, you know, you still stay busy and you still have to take care of your patients um, and you have to be attentive, you know, and always remember why you're there and what you're doing it for. That's my family. Well, that's probably a couple of years ago at the start of the pandemic when my daughter had turned, became a teenager. So sometimes people will think, well, physical medicine and rehab is that physical therapy. And it's not a physical therapy that, you know, I went to medical school. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, a lot of our specialty go to DO school. So you do have to go through that training. And then there's a four year residency training. And it is one of the, you know, 24 specialties that is certified by American Board of Medical Specialties. The history of our field, I like to tell a little bit about it. So it actually began with two, two things. Um, well, it started in the 30s, but it really grew with World War II because World War II, they started to have things like antibiotics. So when people got injured in war and got maybe an amputation or an infection or a wound that was infect, infected, they didn't just die because now they had antibiotics. So now they were living and they had things like amputations or other types of injuries and they needed rehabilitation for it. So that was part of how the field came out and needing physicians to take care of these veterans. And then really the polio epidemic was also um, a big catalyst for starting our field because in that time, actually a lot in the South and the Southwest. So, you know, part Texas, because I'm in Texas, we had a lot of polio here. I wasn't alive then, but so I'm read and told. Um, and the patients, some of them were becoming very disabled. Some of them were needing iron lungs, like you can see in that picture. And so there had to be physicians and nurses and care teams that took care of these patients who had polio. Of course, they did eventually, you know, come out with a vaccine and polio was therefore, you know, it was decreased how bad it was. And those hospitals that were initially pol polio hospitals became rehabilitation hospitals. And so that's kind of also where a lot of the physical medicine and rehabilitation continued was from there. And then Finally, like the physical medicine part and the rehabilitation part came all together and formed the field in 1947. So what is a rehabilitation physician? This is, um, you know, myself and some of my colleagues at different um, conferences, but we are experts in nerve muscles and bones because we are all about function we, and how your body works. And so we have to be experts in knowing exactly what touches to what, what can get injured, what nerve may be injured, we treat these injuries and illness that affect how people move and function. We want to decrease people's pain and really improve quality of life. And it's a quality of life field and not just because I have a good quality of life, but because my goal is to make my patients have a better quality of life. And so we can treat so many different um, conditions and see patients with different things because it's kind of like anything that impairs your function, any kind of anything as serious as a spinal cord injury and someone who may become quadriplegic, 
to um, a sports related injury, um, amputation, a back pain, carpal tunnel, work related injury. Yesterday, if anyone watches NFL football, you may have seen that there's a Tua, the quarterback for Miami, who had had an obvious concussion on Sunday and then played last night and then got hit again and then had this tonic reflex afterwards after getting hit again that is part of having at least a moderate traumatic brain injury and you know so those are the kinds of things that I am a specialist in brain injury so I could recognize and talk about and treat patients like that. Um, so what's your organ? Because you'll say, well, like cardiology has the heart and dermatology has the skin and nephrology has the kidneys. So what is physical medicine and rehabilitation? And I've kind of said like function because we care about mobility and getting people improved in their quality of life and enhance their performance. And it's not just one part of the body, but it's kind of comprehensive. I look at everything. I look at um you know, medical, social, cognitive, phys you know, their mental health, their um, getting back to work and getting back to their family and participating in their community. And that's kind of what, you know, I take care of for patients. So it's a lot of work, but it's great. Like I said, I did one year of internship and then three years of a specialty training in physical medicine and rehabilitation you know, I never broke the work hour rules. I had both my kids during residency. And I think I was able to do that because of good family support. I know a lot of people always ask that, they, you know, is it possible to have family when you're training and when you're a physician? And the answer is yes. Um, I had both of mine, even after a little difficulty with getting pregnant, um, was still able to have my two kids. And we had wonderful childcare because my in-laws lived in town and my mother-in-law helped take care of our kids. So, you know, that was something that's so important because one thing that becomes very difficult for parents is child care and realizing who's going to take care of your kid while you have to work. And we always had that support. And so for that, I'm very thankful. Um, those are my little kids when they're little and I was closer to being a resident age than I am now because my kids are too big to sit on my lap. Uh, at this point. <laughs> um, so there's, like I say, physical medicine is a little bit different than rehabilitation. Physical medicine is the part of, that's kind of more like, I always say non-surgical orthopedic. So you're not doing surgery, but you're doing, you're still evaluate, evaluating musculoskeletal system. You do sports clinics, um, back pain, knee pain, uh, the, you know, tennis elbow, shoulder pain, any other kind of pains in joints. Um, so we get that training in pain management and sports medicine, um, injections. Like you, so it's still very, even though you're not going to the, maybe to the operating room and, you know, repairing someone's spine, you're still, I have colleagues in training and pain management. They still go to the, do things like in injections into the spine, they put devices, they put spinal cord stimulators, they put in uh, intrathecal pumps, and then also injections with ultrasound guidance. And so um, some people in PM&R want to go into pain management, they say it's the painless path to pain. And it's probably the best training for pain management, because you learn the musculoskeletal system. And there's also tra uh, training in electrodiagnostics, which is electromyography. So that's the test I know sometimes, you know, where they um, give people little shocks to measure their nerve conductions and then put needles in their muscles to see how muscles are working. Um, and so you can diagnose anything from as simple as carpal tunnel to as severe as Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, so again, having a lot of tools to be able to diagnose neuromusculoskeletal conditions um, and a physical medicine patient. This is my own story. So I have, like I talked, I've been a runner. I've ran track and high, track and cross country in high school. I've always kind of run through, you know, medical school and residency and then a little bit when my kids were born and then got as a master. So then like being a little bit older, later thirties and forties started running again in track. So that was, um, an indoor track meet a few years ago. And I had run a, it was a four by 400 relay with some girlfriends of mine who also got back into running track again. 
and unfortunately at that race tore my plantar fascia so not even just plantar fasciitis but tore the thing on the bottom of my foot um, and so I went to go see my physical medicine and rehabilitation doctor because it was super painful. Couldn't even put weight through my foot afterwards. I did finish the race. We did win the relay, by the way. And um, so you can see if you look at this ultrasound, this really dark section right there is where the tear is. Um, and so I got uh, injections of PRP, platelet rich plasma. So that's where they like get your blood centrifuge it down and find the, your plasma part of it and then inject it into that area to help with healing and making new cells and such. And so after a few months time, you can see there's already healing. There's, or this was like the initial one and there's all this swelling, the dark spots. And then after a few, this was probably about six to eight weeks into it, then you can see it's almost all the black spots are gone. And so that's some things that our specialists do when there's patients like me who are running. Um, at that time when I was running, I was training both for the Boston Marathon and for the track meet. And it's probably not too good to put both kind of stress loads on your body. But then I had to miss the Boston Marathon that year, but was able to run it the next year. Um, and so that's me very happily running the Boston marathon and, you know, being happy that my feet were all healed by that point. The rehabilitation part of PM&R is um, the long-term care of patients who have, you know, more significant disorders like brain injury, spinal cord injury, stroke, amputations, multiple traumas, you know, those people that get in car accidents. And we work in inpatient rehabilitation units where that's where patients can go after their injuries and they get intense therapy. So we lead a team, we work with a team, we work with PT, OT, speech therapy, social workers, nurses, case managers, and help, you know, help the patient get better. So we may order the therapies, we do their medical management, we order medications. If someone has a really severe brain injury, we'll order medications to try to wake them up. If someone, you know, is in a coma, if someone um, has spinal cord injury, there's a lot of issues they will have with their bowel, bladder, um, autonomic nervous system. So we work on treating that as well. And then my specialty, one of my specialties is spasticity management. And that's when patients get really tight, like muscle spasms after having a brain injury or spinal cord injury and their muscles tighten up. And I do injections with botulinum toxin. So basically Botox is not just used for cosmetic. They used it 20 years before the cosmetic purpose for medical purposes. And that's what I use. I inject um, botulinum toxin in patients' muscles to help them get mobility and um, function back. So it's just part of like my rehabilitation where, you know, I've in the first picture on the left, one of my patients who had a, a big brain bleed when he was on vacation and they had found that he had had an aneurysm and he has really, you know, improved significantly. So where he could be someone that, um, wants to, you know, volunteer at the hospital and just some other patients of mine that I've, with the one on the right, I thought was me at his wedding. Uh, my typical day, I used to drop off, run in the morning, drop off my kids. Uh, I, now I don't drop them off because one, my husband drops one off because he works from home and my other kid walks to school and then work or work all day. Um, in this, our specialty, there's all types of fellowships that people can do, whether it pain, sports, spinal cord, brain injury, electrodiagnostics, and all these other things. I'll tell you about some famous physiatrists. So Dr. Janet Travell, she was actually um, the personal physician of John F. Kennedy, and she treated his chronic back problems after World War II. And she was the first female presidential physician. So the, of all the doctors, they always have their presidential physicians. Um, she was the first woman one. And then she, after he was assassinated, she was also the doctor for LBJ and, uh, and his family too. She has this major book that's kind of a 
you know, mainstay in our specialty about myofascial pain and dysfunction. So that's kind of when you get all the knots in your neck and your shoulders and what that means and how that can be treated. And she treated JFK, you know, he had a leg length discrepancy. So she gave him a shoe lift. She would give him injections, trigger point injections for those pains that he would have. And then he was very famous for being in this rocking chair. And the reason he was in the rocking chair was more for physical to um, alleviate his black back tension. And so that's kind of cool. Um, Dr. David. I have a C- uh-huh. Yeah. So FDR didn't have a physiotherapy, uh, a PM&R doctor. So that it's was his the- PM&R doctor. Yeah, that was his PM&R doctor was his doctor. No, I'm, I'm talking about uh, Roosevelt uh, since he was polio. Oh, because he had polio. No, yeah, so no, he started, um, or not that I know of, because then it was just kind of doctors taking care of polio patients. But he did um, do a lot for rehabilitation because he wanted to start healing himself, you know, heal himself and help people. So he used hydrotherapy or a lot of water therapy. One of his rehab centers was called Warm Springs. And it was literally like water therapy where he would get in and it would be used for healing. And so a lot of the original like physical medicine doctors use that water as a physical healing modality. And that was something that actually came up out of FDR. So yes. Yeah. He had a pole put into the white house. Yeah. And he actually did die uh, in, at a rehab place where he went. So when he passed away, he was actually getting, he was reha- getting rehab. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Cool. Now I'm learning a little bit too. This doctor, Dr. Sifu, he's a national director of PM&R at all the veterans hospitals, and he is a super TBI specialist for the VA. He has like millions and million dollars of grants to study brain injury, especially if you think about all the, uh, you know, the uh, military who then became veterans and had all the types of, you know, blast injuries and concussions from being part of the military. And so he studies that and leads it throughout the country. I have some of my friends that are, you know, colleagues around the country. Um, On the right is uh, Dr. Ellen Casey, and she is a sports medicine doctor. She is now the physician for USA Women's Gymnastics. Remember before it was like shameful and there was that other doctor that of course now is in jail. Um, And so now they had this amazing woman physiatrist doctor to take care of the gymnasts. And then the other physician, um, Sherry Blawett, she herself had a spinal cord injury when she was a young girl in a farming accident and um, has had to use a wheelchair for the rest of her life. And she has been in the Paralympics three times. She's even won the Boston Marathon and New York City Marathon for the wheelchair division before. And she chairs the International Paralympic Medical Committee. And she also helps run the Boston Marathon, um, you know, from a medical perspective as well. So, you know, very important physiatrist doing good things. My other friend, Monica. She was, yeah, she was in two Olympics in medical school. Yeah, gold. Should, yeah, exactly. Yeah, she's amazing. Yeah, I've, I've heard her story um, that she was also running Boston Marathon and yeah. While she was in school and read, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, Dr. Rowe, she uh, is sports medicine physician and a research scientist, and she's the t- team physician for the U.S. women's soccer team. So I'm like, look at how cool my friends are. And she used to like play soccer growing up, but wasn't that, you know, she wasn't well, ever on the women's soccer team or anything, but now she gets to be their team physician and she got to go to the world cup with them and be all over France for all those months that they were playing. So very cool. Um, Julie Silver, she is an associate chair at Harvard medical, their department of PM and R and she does cancer rehab, but her big thing is she's an expert on diversity. She's an expert on women. She leads a course um, called the career advancement and leadership skills for women in healthcare. That's a, car, a very 
reputable course that's given for women at that's at Harvard, but it's open for everyone. So she's also does so much research also related to gender equity studies and DEI. So, you know, it's a young field, not that many people we need. There's a big need for PM&R doctors. So, you know, please, you know, people are getting older, people need these jobs. <laughs> My poor son texts me, can you get me something to eat? Not right now, since what a good mom I am. Um, and you kind of can do what you want to do. Um, you're always part of a team. Your patients, <coughs> your patients want to get better. You do well financially. Um, I have some friends that do things like uh, women's health, and they work a lot on pelvic floor and taking care of women um, who are having health, you know, pelvic floor related issues. I have some that do cancer rehab. Now I'm doing a lot of long COVID and we're going to talk a little bit about that and the effects of COVID and how people need to improve their function and quality of life after that. So, you know, this has now become a new career tra trajectory for me. So a little bit about just kind of that's my field and that's why it's awesome. And, you know, I'm going to recommend it to everyone, but um, also I am from the Valley, a different than the California Valley that some of y'all might be from, but um, the real Grandy Valley is on the tip of Texas. So it's the South Texas on the border with Mexico at the Gulf of Mexico. Um, I'm the oldest of three kids. My parents um, were from big families. Um, then my grandparents and great grandparents, some of them came from Mexico. So that's mostly where we're Mexican American. And uh, my parents were, you know, really wanted us to focus on our education. They really allowed me to um, see that I was a good student and say, you know, put your efforts into your studies. I so say that's why I'm a kind of now I'm not the I'm not the mom that cooks. That's why my son's like, will you pick me something up? Because obviously I didn't make any food. Um, but, but it was nice also to see my mom was also not in a very traditional, like Latina role because she always worked too. And she actually made more money than my dad. So I was already had a kind of a role model of someone that was, you know, working and hustling as a woman. Um, and then I was always allowed to do my studies. I was in a high school where when I was a freshman, we started with a thousand students. And by the time I graduated from high school, there was only 400 students. So because of it wasn't a great high school, um, a lot of people had obviously dropped out um, where I was from. And, you know, but I did very good in high school in the situation that I was, which was behind you know, there wasn't that many AP classes and such. So, um, but I still did well. I was able to go to college. Like when I might intro, I went to Rice, which was this college where everyone went. And it was really hard for me because all these other people that were there, they were from these elite private schools and elite schools and rich places that I obviously was not from. And it was really hard. It was like, um, and that's one thing is that I was very lucky that I was in one of those direct entry programs. So I was able to be in the, one of those programs where, you know, going in, I knew I was going to be able to get into medical school as long as I kept certain GPA and did certain classes. And so I felt very lucky that I was able to do that. So even if I had one semester that was bad, I always say like, my first semester of organic chemistry was hard. I didn't have a good chemistry background. I got a C and um, definitely did better on the second semester. But And I was lucky that I was in this direct entry program because I was able to be a little bit more flexible with my grades and not to have just like A's and everything. And I felt like that class really does weed out a lot of really good students and we weed out people who maybe didn't have the good foundation which I didn't have either. And I feel like, well, I made it and I'm a successful doctor and how many other people, you know, potential future doctors are being left out by those kinds of classes. But I digress. Um, it was hard, I made it, made it through medical school. Uh, medical school also hard because I didn't major in a science, but that's okay because I loved what I did. I majored in Latin American studies. I studied abroad. I, um, you know, took the classes I needed to take. And in medical school, I was 
like, okay, I'm gonna study really hard because this is gonna be hard again. I made friends with the smartest students and I went to all the classes and I sat on the second row and I took notes and I studied all the time. I mean, I would, when times were around tests, I used to take, I had a shower where there was like glass on the outside and I put study notes on the outside of the glass because I had to feel like I was studying at all times. And that's how intense it is in medical school. Um, and still there were times then that I thought I was alone. There's not that many Latinos in my class. A lot of them were from programs like mine, and it was hard for a lot of us, but you know, we had our, what was the equivalent of our LMSA group then to help us get through. And we had our diversity office that sometimes provided um, tutoring or something as needed. So part of my advice to getting there is like not being afraid to ask for help, going for tutoring, going to the office, going to the teacher's office to ask like, please help me with this going to those office hours. That's why the office hours are open to be used. I remember in undergrad, one of my, um, my physics teacher, I would go to the room and then I'd, he'd be in his desk and I walk behind and be like, hi professor. And he just knew me by my voice at that point, because I have to go and ask for help, obviously all the time, if you knew my voice, but that's definitely like, don't be afraid to go and ask for help. And even had to get free tutoring during med school when things were hard found my specialty, loved my specialty, um, got into a residency. Part of the part of the reason I picked my residency was um, to have to be close to family. So that way, you know, because I did want to start a family and that was one of my goals. Um, and then when I was done with, had both my kids during residency at the end of that, got a job into um into academic medicine. And it was, I was just happy to have a job. I was just happy that I was going to be employed. And I didn't realize that when I got that first job, I wasn't making that much. I mean, I was making, like I said, it's a doctor's salary. It was a lot to me because even when I was a resident, I was already making more money than my family. So a lot of times residents who are in training complain, they don't make that much money. But for me, someone that, you know, didn't have a my family wasn't real off being first generation to be in medicine. I didn't, I thought that was a good amount of money as a resident. And then as a faculty, I thought that was a great amount of money, not knowing that I was being paid probably in the like first percentile of all academic doctors and less than some of my colleagues who were men, which we seem to know happens more and more, but again, just happy that I had a job and, um, you know, started work, worked, worked. And the other thing is I'm very good. I'm efficient. You know, I'm a woman. I get lots of things done. I can multitask. I was a mom. So I had to learn to be, you know, fast and good at things. And um, in academic medicine, again, this is something a lot of people don't know about. I didn't know. I just wanted a job, but I didn't even realize fully that when you're in academic medicine, again, because no one in my family was in academic medicine or in medicine, that, oh, you know, there's different levels. You come in at this bottom level as an assistant professor, and then you the, then people move up to an associate professor, and then people become full professors, and some of them have tenure. And I didn't understand what all that meant because that just wasn't part of what I, I knew. Um, and so I came in as assistant professor, and I was that all the time. And to be able to move up to the next level you have to be able to be, you know, well-rounded in everything. You have to have research. You have to be teaching. You have to be a leader. You have to be developing programs and do the clinical work. And I was very good at the clinical work and I was very good at the teaching, um, but I hadn't worked as much in the research and some of the other stuff. So when I was a faculty, finally, when I started realizing like, I need to do this stuff and I did do some, and then it was like, well, I'm gonna see about if I could be promoted. So I took my CV, my resume to one of our deans and said, please look at my resume. What do you think? And he looked at my resume and he said, I'll give you a 50, 50 shot of being promoted. And I was like, oh, 50, 50, that doesn't sound good. My coworker, who is a guy, male, went, um, showed the same dean his CV, and they and he told him, I'll give you a 50-50 shot of going for it. And you know what he said? He said, I'm going to go for it. And you know what I said? I said, like, no, 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 that's not good enough. And if you know, if you've read other some data that says that women 
are will not go for a position unless they feel they meet 100% of the criteria, but men will go for a position or a job, even if they just meet 50 or 60% of the criteria, they're going to go for it. So I did not go for it. My colleague went for it. He applied. He made it. He got that new title. He got a raise. He got, you know, it, it comes with being promoted. And I did not because I didn't go for it. So, of course, I waited the next year. And yes, the next year I easily got it because by then I built my resume a lot and got, was able to do a lot of national level things. But it was a tough lesson to learn that had I, I should have just gone for it. There would have been nothing to lose had I not gone for it. But when I did, that was a picture from when I was, became an associate professor, which was the next level. And I'm with the dean, which is the woman lady was the dean, the full dean of the medical school I was in at that time. And at that time that I became an associate professor, again, at the next level in academic medicine, I was only the eighth. Latina associate professor of physical medicine and rehabilitation in the country, and that includes Puerto Rico. So in the whole country at that time, there was only, I was only the eighth person to be promoted to that level in the whole country. So it's kind of like blew my mind when I saw those numbers of how little representation there was. And so, you know, I continue to work, continue to do more things. When this job came up to be the department chair at a different, I was in Houston then, but to move to San Antonio, I went to my friend, Julie Silver, the one that I said, who um, has the leadership course and said, this opportunity has come up. Should I apply for it? I said, I don't meet all the criteria because it says that you have to be already a full tenured professor to do it. And she was like, go for it. What's it gonna hurt you to do it? What if you don't get the job? You don't get it, you already have another job. You don't lose your job. So that's kind of one of my advice to go for it. And I went for it and actually like I did meet all a lot of the criteria that they wanted and I got to move and become department chair and um, become a full tenured professor. And when I was, there was only two other Latina full tenured professors in the whole country and in the, like Puerto Rico. So if you think there's not very many people. So I've always been like, okay, I'm gonna push myself more and more to get to the next levels. Uh, let's see what other, uh -huh. oh go back to the questions at the end. So what else do I get to do? Like, I love to write, I love to talk about things like inclusion, diversity, uh, health equity. And, you know, I work with teams and with friend, friend, now friends to, you know, write about these topics um, and publish on them. I get to, um, you know, advocacy is a big thing that I do now too. One thing, you know, we notice things that are going on and we write about them, we publish about them. When COVID started, that was something that, you know, I saw there is a need because I was seeing when COVID was happening, it was disproportionately impacting certain communities. It was disproportionately impacting minoritized communities, Black, Latinx, Native American, and these patients were hospitalized more, dying more, having worse outcomes. So I said, we need to step up you know, in our field of physical medicine and rehab and be able to rehabilitate these patients. And, you know, we wrote a paper about, you know, how we had to take care of these survivors. And, you know, at work, we did a lot of telemedicine and how I was noticing there was disparities even for persons who had disabilities to do telemedicine. So we published on that. I've been on a lot of podcasts at this point. Like I said, Healthcare disparities is something I'm very passionate about, um, especially given my, my background. Um, and, you know, the may the odds be ever in your favor is not just from the Hunger Games, but it's also, you know, what some people live in every day when it comes to healthcare access. And there are differences in the quality of services that people get, and not just because they're, you know, it's not financial, but it's really because of, you know, some other reasons that are not due to their clinical needs or their preferences. And I, you know, I always, this is a story, this is myself in the middle of my two siblings and my grandfather, he had a stroke 
when I was a senior in college. And again, I'm the only medical person. By then I was in college. I wasn't even medical yet. I didn't know anything about medicine. And so everyone was, it was shock. It was terrible. I mean, here's this patriarch of our family, the father of 13 kids. He has like 50 grandkids at this point. Um, and he was in World War II. He, um, you know, provided for this as someone without an education who only went to 10th grade to his family of 13 kids and then had this stroke and it was something that was very devastating for us. And so I remember then, like, again, no one knew about stroke, no one knew about healthcare system, very low health literacy. And I remember going seeing him at a nursing home because from the hospital, he went to a nursing home where he had stayed in that nursing home for the rest of his life. And actually, now that I study, that I do rehabilitation and I take care of patients with stroke, the best place for patients to go after you have a stroke is to an inpatient rehabilitation with a PM&R doctor that's taking care of you and you're getting three hours of therapy a day. And he was someone that would have been a very good candidate, but it just happens now that I look and research and study the data that Latinos are less likely to get into that level of care, even though he had two types of insurance and he had family that he could have discharged to and his stroke was not like it was severe, but it wasn't like he was totally paralyzed. I saw him, he could move both his arms and his legs. And it just happens for reasons, whether it be bias, unconscious bias, systemic racism, you know, that we're not getting those types of care. So it's something now that really drives what I do. This is a paper that I co-authored where we talked about these disparities of care for Hispanic patients when it comes to things like stroke, brain injury, spinal cord injury. We have a similar patient, a paper that we wrote for black patients. We said like, even when they have spinal cord injuries, why is it that spinal cord injuries happen more in black people, especially when it comes to something like traumas and gunshot wounds. And then when they have one, they're less likely to get surgery and they're less likely to go to rehabilitation. And then we're seeing the same things, like I said, with COVID-19, um, you know, Native American, Black, Hispanic, we're getting a lot more hospitalizations and death. And so that's why I, and then in where I was from, the real Grande Valley, I talked about that. This was a place that was devastated by COVID. I mean, my sister had five of her friends lose their parents to COVID-19. It was just so bad down there, especially in that first year before there was vaccines. Um, so again, a lot of disproportionate impact. And so that's where I started the first COVID recovery clinic in South Texas, probably the second one in Texas, you know, to help people who needed, who were impacted by COVID and needed rehabilitation services and make sure we address the needs of our people. This has been now something that, you know, now I've published so many papers on it. I lead with my institute. I tweet about it. I'm on Instagram talking about long COVID and was then eventually invited even to give a congressional testimony in DC. So, you know, that morning I was invited by um, Jim Clyburn's office and got to go and talk to the Senate uh, subcommittee in DC that more, that was my morning. I went to go run first. You know, I went to go to the Lincoln Monument and that's also where Martin Luther King had stood, unfortunately, um, before he died. And then that later that afternoon got to testify and talk about, you know, what patients with long COVID are dealing with and how this is a new disability and how we need to be addressed. You know, we really be, need to be addressing these needs through rehabilitation and research and treatments and financial support for people. Um, I love doing outreach. I love, you know, meeting with groups. This was probably pre-pandemic, but I got to meet yesterday with our LMSA students. So I was very happy again. Um, I get to be on the news. I get to be on podcasts and just talk about different things from rehab to now a lot of long COVID and, um, you know, reach out on, I'm on social media. This is uh, like my earlier tweets. I now even on Twitter have, you know, over 20,000 followers where I get to talk about, you know, running my life, PM&R, COVID, long COVID, mostly too. Um, 
So that's, I'll look at now, I'll stop sharing and now we can just answer questions and I'll look at the Q and A. All right, let's see what we have here. What advice would you give to undergrad students pursuing a career in medicine? So again, don't be afraid to ask for help. Look for, you know, I do think it's important that you do some of the, you know, the MCAT's important. You have to study for that. The, you know, you can think like everyone who, all the people that have a lot of money, they can take all the prep courses. Try to find a scholarship where you can also get a prep course or figure out a way to, you know, do a prep course. So I think that's important. Um, is it possible to have your own PMR practice or does the specialty require a hospital or bigger location to treat patients? Either or both. So I have like some one of my friends, two of my friends in residency have their own practice. They do pain and sports and musculoskeletal medicine. Um, and then there's some that work in hospital systems and do inpatient. It just kind of depends on what kind of practice you have. I have some that um, they work for themselves, but they'll go to different hospitals and see patients in the inpatient rehab unit. And then there's some that are in academic centers. So really, like I said, you can make it what you want and do what you want with it. Um, and so, yeah, you can have your own practice for sure. Uh, what was the process of applying for residency like? It was, it gets harder and harder. Um, I will tell you that because now that I'm a program director, so I look at applications that come in and, you know, the applicants are amazing. So you, it, there's a match and you have to do an application online and then you have to find programs that you want. And then you have to um, also with that need to be able to, you know, submit and then hope that the, pre the programs like you. Um, so back then I was, in Houston at Baylor College of Medicine. The program there is very excellent. And I was already married as I got married as a medical student. And we kind of, you know, I looked at different programs at, though I looked in Chicago, I looked at Harvard, I looked in Seattle. And I had to come and be like, what, am, what, where am I gonna go? And then I went to go speak to one of like our vice deans for students. And he had said, what are your priorities? I said, okay, God, family, and my work. And then he said, okay, we'll make your list according to your priorities. So knowing that, you know, eventually we wanted to probably have a family, then that's why I chose to stay in Houston where we were close, in Texas, where we had our family support. So, um, and then did end up match, matching where I wanted to go, was very happy with my choice. So um, yeah, all these things get competitive, but. All right. Was it hard to get mentorship while in med school? Um, yes and no. You have to kind of go out and find it and pick it, you know, find it and ask for it. And um, I'm really thankful that we did have a diversity office because the diversity office was willing to, um, you know, find mentors for us, have events for us, put us together with other students and other, you know, alumni that look like us in the community so I could go to them. It was also interesting that um, when I was looking into, like I said, I'd never heard about my specialty before I had gone into medical school. And it had, it ended up that one of the residents at my program had been a guy that had gone to undergrad with me who was like an who was older um and so it was good to see him again and say and me say oh he's a good guy he's a normal guy maybe i need to look more into this field and him being tell telling me about, more about it and then getting mentorship from the residents that i met and looking up to the attending so that was kind of so it was you, you could find it. And I feel like now there's so much more because now there's so much virtual and, you know, now all the students, they get involved. Like we have the Association of Academic Physiatrists and they have a med student council. And in the med student council, these are for students who might want to go into the field and they have a mentorship program where they put like MS ones and twos and they put them together with ones who are already applying. So that way they can learn about the process. So I feel like there's a lot of even peer mentorship that's going on through national societies and through through groups and virtually, like I said, we didn't have that back in my day. 
Um, oh, given my efforts in addressing healthcare disparities, have I seen change being implemented? Um, that's a good question. It's slow, but we're trying to, to make it happen. I think it's kind of the first part is educating people and publishing the data and saying, hey, this is here. Did you know this? Did you realize this? I mean, I gave a grand rounds this morning to our Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery, where I tell about my grandpa, where I tell about this research I've done, where I tell about, you know, some other disparities reach research that I've done in spasticity management and just hope to educate people. Cause I think the first thing is they need to realize it and say like, oh, is that what's happening? Or, you know, so hopefully changes are start, starting to be made. So, so we'll see, I don't know. Um, is it ever frustrating to work in healthcare due to its inherent capitalistic nature? If so, how do you overcome this frustration and keep pushing? <laughs> I love it, yes. Um, it can be because some of the, um, way that the system is set up it's it's a lot of the way that doctors get paid now is fee for service and that means the more patients you see the more money you get the more but if you to see a lot of patients you have to only give them a little bit of time and some patients need a lot of time and that especially happens in the patients that have long covid because they have you know so many complaints and they've already been blown off by so many doctors because they're like fatigued heart rate race hearts racing, numbness, tingling, headaches, brain fog. And I can't do that in a 15 minute visit. So, you know, I take my time with patients, but it comes at a cost that the system doesn't reward us for. So there's that, but I don't know. Things are supposedly going towards quality. And then sometimes hopefully maybe I'll get a grant or something to help me do more of this work. All right, what was the biggest shock when I started medical school? Huh. Like I said that, okay, one big shock about medical school was that, that there is a lot of people there who have a lot of, whose families, this is still kind of a shock to me now that families come from, a, they came from not first generation, like I was, like, there's a lot of people whose parents were already doctors, multiple generations already being doctors, had a lot of financial resources, didn't have to take out loans to go to any schooling. Um, you know, it was just kind of like, ooh, mind blowing to me. Um, and so I came from a very different background that way. Um, so that was one of the shocks, but you know, there were still, you, you found like people, you got in groups and you found friends and you, you got in organizations where you found where there was people like you and you found support that way. Probably some of the other biggest shock of starting med school was, um, hmm, what else? That there's still gender disparities. There's still, you know, sexual harassment, unfortunately, that kind of stuff in there. And you think like, oh, we should, this should be this perfect institute of medicine, but there's still problems, there's still bias, there's still, um, you know, harassment and everything else. So those are kind of the, the all right, you, you won't be shocked anymore once you go. <laughs> My, I have a question. So yeah. you were, you were first gen and you didn't, and you had to take loans and everything. Since you've finished residency, have you ever struggled financially or you've always been able to find a job and uh, and just talk a little bit about that because I think a lot of first gen students they look at that price tag of student loans and and <laughs> what see I know this is the thing that for me and when I went through med school and undergrad it was so much less expensive than what it is now you know and and I'm I don't know I'm old but not like super old <laughs> um so even for people that were older, it was almost nothing. I was, I have papers where we talk about how debt and how, you know, not making as much money and having a lot of educational debt is contributing to burnout. So that is definitely a problem that we're seeing now in medicine. And it's so tough, but there are ways to get oh, it's so much now. And it's, it's hard because it impacts people's like wanting to go into medicine what specialty they choose, if they go into academic medicine or private practice, thinking like private practice might make more money, whether that be true or not, you know, it depends on the specialty and what you're doing. 
but there are also real ways to like get that debt paid off, but it's just scary going into it. Like if you, if someone works at my Institute, the new faculty, they can get the PCLF, the like, um, gosh, what does that stand for? The loan forgiveness. There's loan forgiveness programs because we serve underserved populations. And there's also loan forgiveness, some loan forgiveness through the veterans that, through the VA. So if you work, you know, for one of the places that's in an underserved community or like a federally funded health uh, type facility, um, some academic places or VAs, then you can get a lot of loans paid off. So one of my coworkers, he's of course, one of the newer faculty, he says, I just have to make so many years of payments of the minimal payments, and then it'll get all paid off. And he's about to almost have it all paid off. So he's like, you know, super excited about that. Um, but yeah, it's tough because it, even private med schools now are so, so expensive compared to some of the public med schools that might be. And then I also got some scholarship too. Um, so that was something that was good. So yes, the plight is bad. I, I didn't even have it as bad as it is now. But definitely my parents, they tried to help as much as they could. And I mean, I feel like in wretched, my mom sold her dream car so that she could help me pay for college. And I still haven't given her a dream car back, but <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, next one. Do program directors check applicant social media? Ain't nobody got time for that, okay? <laughs> I mean, if I'm already following you, then I might just see you and interact with you. I think it's more of a positive thing, but I'm not gonna go like, creep in your social media to see what you have on there. I don't have time to do that. I barely have time to read all the applications. So <laughs> um, what were some of the challenges you faced starting your family during well, social social media say that if you want, if you don't want your mom or grandma to see it, don't post it. Yeah. So that's the other thing is that just uh, keep it clean in general, then you don't have to worry about that. Right. <laughs> um challenges with my family during residency. So first was that um, I had problems getting pregnant to start with. And there's studies that show that women physicians are definitely have more problems with fertility than the general population. And it might be that, you know, do we start a little bit later? Do we have more stress? That sort of thing. So, you know, I had fertility problems, which was really stressful to start with, but then eventually um, was able to have my kids. I had to work my first year like that I was pregnant and not take any of my vacations because I was trying to save all my vacation days so that when I had my baby I could take those vacation days then and I'd be paid because then it was like if I don't get paid after I have you know for my maternity leave time so that was kind of stressful and then I only took about seven weeks for maternity leave um, before having to go back to work and then when I went back to work I was on like night call the first night. So it's like, they don't care like, oh, that you have a new, you know, a seven week old at home that I'm trying to breastfeed and that trying to pump. And, and sometimes, you know, doctors wouldn't want to let you pump and you're supposed to, it is like legal, please go let the resident pump. But, you know, still sometimes you're judged for doing those kinds of things. Um, my son, my 13 year old son now, he was, we have a big, like in my, we live in this big multi-generational family home now. So it's like me, my husband, my two kids, but my in-laws live with us now. And my sister-in-law, who's a single mom and her two little babies live with us too, because we have to support them. So we're like a big, still multi-generational Latino family. And my three-year-old nephew started school recently and he had such a hard time. He was like crying, crying, because he was so used to his mommy just being with him all the time because, she, you know, uh, she was just there all the time for him. And my son goes, oh, I didn't have that problem, but that's because you only took six weeks off and you, uh, spent half your time at the hospital <laughs> so I was like ouch thanks not like he really remembered that from being a you know six weeks old or anything but then you still get a little bit mom guilt later on in life so has there ever been a moment throughout your career that has left a significant impact on you yeah lots of moments so kind of that one I probably said like the biggest learning lesson the lesson that I learned was not going for it that first time when I was trying to get promoted. 
So that was really significantly impactful. Um, you know, there's people that I've met that have impacted my life. I have another story that I like to give that um, because I'm someone that, you know, like I'm here wearing my Latina shirt today. I am very, I'm a runner. So I like to wear just like really cool sneakers also to work sometimes, but with professional clothes and then like cool sneakers. And I used to do that at my old job that I had. And my old boss was like, why are you wearing sneakers? That's so unprofessional. I'm like we're in a rehab hospital. These are leather. These are really nice shoes. I mean, like I wear golden goose right now. Like, you know, those are really nice shoes. Um, and he was like really upset and for some reason about it. And, um, you know, I'd said, well, you have to be careful about how you're policing people. Women usually get more policed about dress code. This is even something that's really bad. It's not even like, it's okay to wear leather sneakers in the dress code of the hospital. And he's like, well, if you want to be a chair one day, you better dress like one. So, you know, trying to fit me into this, like, here is this what you should be looking like if you're going to be in this position. And so, you know, sometime later, then eventually I did become a chair and I still wear my very cool sneakers because I don't think that, you know, what you wear should define you. So that's something else that, you know, I think is really important for me. I'm surprised that HR did not pay him a visit because that. <laughs> I know, right. Because yeah. I, I work in a hospital and they told uh, one of the residents that they can't wear and it was a big issue because it was not it was not even an an, an inappropriate thing but anyway yeah but yeah yeah so i'm like people wear what you want to wear you know <laughs> do your work that's what's important all right how is it getting support in undergrad um and then how was I able to get into med school right after? Like I said, I was in a program, I was in what, you know, one of those direct entry programs. And so that's something that I'm very thankful that I was able to, you know, have the foresight of like when I was younger to say like, I want to be a doctor and I'm a good student. And I was able to get in a program that was going to get me into medical school at the end of undergrad. Um, getting support in undergrad, I probably didn't take advantage of it as much as I could have, like as much as I did in medical school. And I was like, whoa, I'm going to really need to do it now. But you know, you have to be not afraid to ask for help. And like I said before, go to the office hours of the teacher, go ask for help, go for tutoring, go see, you know, is there some kind of free tutoring? Is there a, uh, you know, a teaching assistant in the class that's offering that? Or is there someone that you know that's super, super smart? Even like I said, in medical school, I became like two of my best friends were MD, PhD students because they were the smartest people because they were also going to get a PhD. And I became friends with them because I wanted them to be able to like help me understand things that I didn't understand in class. So um, yeah, just don't be afraid to ask for help. Uh, do you have any recommendations, suggestions of different programs or extracurricular activities that might help us as applicants? So I think the most important thing is just to do some, don't do something just to, so it can be on your application, but do something that, you know, that it, that you love and that is something that you want to do. So whether that be, you know, volunteer work or it be, you know, I also really, like if you had to do something outside the box, like you had to work because you have to work to get by in school, then put that and explain it. And I'll, that'll be something that I appreciate because there's a lot, like I said, there's a lot of people that didn't have to work and didn't have that life experience. Like I appreciate that hustle. The other day I was um, at line in a fruteria. You know, those are the places where they cut up the fruits and the mangoes and whatever. And it was kind of a long line. And there was two people there and they were like working hard and they're like hustling. They're making everyone's like fruits and elotes and everything. And finally, when my turn came up, I was wearing a shirt from the medical school. Um, and the person behind the counter was like, oh, are you a student there? At first, I was like, thank you. No, I'm a doctor. But they thought I looked like a student. And and she said that she was a nursing student. And to me, I was like, you, I want to hire you to be my nurse one day when you're a nurse, because she, to me, she was like there working hard, hustling and being a student at the same time at that kind of job. And that's something that, you know, I appreciate too. So 
you know, if you need a program like a post back, if you need, you know, there's programs where there's experiences, but, you know, do what, do what you need to do and do what you find passion in. All right. Am I still friends with my friends growing up or with my medical school friends? So <laughs> yes to both. I have some friends growing up that, you know, maybe they don't live here, but, you know, we still keep in touch or we text my friends from medical school, again, the same thing, you know, we'll may not always be together in the same city. My friends from residency are still my, we're still like on a text chain and we, some of us all text together all the time. Um, ooh, excuse me. And so, yeah, for sure. I am. So you make these people, they're like your lifelong friends because you go through so much with them. That's hard. What type of volunteering or clinical hours do you recommend doing for someone that's applying to medical school? Like I said, um, just see if you can, there's volunteer programs at hospitals, there's volunteer programs. And sometimes, you know, everyone wants to go to the usual traditional hospitals, like, oh, there's a the big hospital, there's the children's hospital. But think about things like the rehab hospital. The rehab hospital probably has less people going and asking to volunteer there. So you might actually like get more opportunities to go see things at a rehab hospital than you would at another hospital. And then, you know, I'm always like, when I look at that kind of stuff, it's also, I think about like, who has privilege? Like how easy would it be for my child to volunteer at a hospital because I have access to the hospital and I'm a leader there versus someone who has like no access, no family, no, you know, those kinds of connections where it's really harder. So again, I kind of like appreciate the story. I, you know, I look at the whole, the whole application. I always think like, I tell one of my friends and I were talking about um, the distance traveled, so someone who, you know, didn't have as much, had a learning disability, didn't have, has a first generation, you know, story family, getting to medical school is a lot harder than someone who's like was born with a silver spoon in their mouth and just like, you know, prep school and tutors and everything and got there really easy. Um, are there still yeah, the only thing, yeah, I would say I work in the ER and there's a lot of undergrad who want to come and volunteer there. And a busy urban trauma center is not a good place that's slow. A rehab place, um, I know one of my friends who worked in a sports medicine clinic um, and rehab, and he got to talk to a lot of the attendings and residents. So yeah, it's, uh, it's you, gotta, you gotta be selective in what you want. Don't do everything what everybody else does. Yeah, exactly. Um, are there still programs around that go from undergrad to medical school? There are. Um, I don't know. I'll put the link on it. Okay. Yeah. So there are, and there's um, like, I know there's still the right, the one with Rice and Baylor, but there's a lot more different universities around the country as well. And then what rotation did I take that convinced me to opt out of applying to a certain specialty? So like when I, like I said, I wanted to go to medical to, I wanted to be the pediatrician and um, when I went into medical school and I still really like pediatrics and I like kids too. And even after my first year of med school, I did a summer program where I got to actually go back to the Valley and shadow and work with my pediatrician who the one who was like inspired me to be into medicine. And that was great and fun and nice, but I think it's just like when I was introduced to PM&R that I liked that so much more. And then I thought, well, maybe I'll do pediatric PM&R because there is a specialty of pediatric PM&R. And so I considered that. So when I was in residency, I did my rotation in pediatric PM&R and during my rotation, I was pregnant and it was just so sad because I saw these kids with all these like tumors and injuries and cerebral palsy and no brain to their no oxygen to their brain and all this stuff and then that made me like oh that seems kind of sad let me do um you know adults and so that's just what i happen to do now but that's me i have a question how did you deal with imposter syndrome so I, so I tell people like, um, yeah, there's definitely imposter syndrome, but some of it, it was also like, I just need to like walk in and do it and 
just think like, what is everything that I've done? And kind of really, you know, and this happens a lot for women and this happens a lot for women and when they, and for first generation and is that you really downplay what you do. And then your CV also, you don't put in enough of what you do versus like people who are really full of themselves or whatever, they like embellish it almost. And so it's like, you have to really like say, okay, well, I was the, you know, let's say when I was the um, chair of the faculty senate and then really explain what I did there, not just say that, but say like, okay, we changed the promotion criteria. We created a new position that was an Obsberg person for people to go when they had complaints. We created a new wellness program for all the faculty. And, you know, just explaining line by line what I did and then, you know, okay, I developed, I was the program director of the fellowship. Okay, when I was a program director of the fellowship, I had to make it accredited with the ACGME. I had this many fellows that all got positions afterward, you know, so you have to start really not just put that, but really know what you did. And then you can realize like, oh, wait, I'm not an imposter. I belong here. I worked hard. I probably worked harder than a lot of other people because of what my background is. Um, and I deserve to be here and to have a seat at the table and just um, to have my voice heard. I have a question. I was wondering when you first became interested in academic medicine and how you found opportunities to go into that. So some of it was looking up to my faculty that I worked with that when I was a resident, I was like, wow, look at these amazing. And I could think of like women that I worked with who are so great, who um, was like, gosh, they seem to, one of them even like would bring her kids sometimes to work with her. I mean, maybe that was like, okay, she was working so much. She had to bring her kids there. But, you know, to me, it was like, look, she could be a mom. She teaches so well. Her patients just love her. She like rounds and like gives off, you know, just teaches and gives like so much um, like pearls of both life wisdom and, you know, medical wisdom. And I can think of like people that I work with like that, that really, you know, made me passionate about having that job in academic medicine and to think like, oh, I want to do that. I like, well, my husband says, you like to feel important, but, <laughs> but I like to, you know, what I think about academic medicine now that makes me the most happy is um, the relationships that I make. And it's not just like, yes, I love my relationships with my patients, but I love the relationships that I have with like the doctors I work with, the trainees that I have, like all the trainees that I've had over time have become friends and colleagues. And we go to meetings together and we, you know, they still, I'm on text chains with them too. So it's like these lifelong friends of people that are just, you know, intelligent and um, respect you and you've worked with and you've been through, you know, stressful times together. And so to me, that was like one of the, and I can make, and they, you know, I went to a meeting this last week and um, one of my past faculty was like, uh, one of my pa past residents who's now at this meeting, also a leader. And it was like, no, I do spasticity because you taught me spasticity. I, learn all about billing because what you taught me about billing. And I just felt like, oh my gosh, I really impacted her career, you know? So that's, you know, why I love doing it. Also, uh, my parents told me don't become a teacher, uh, but I think they meant like, don't be a, a teacher at a school. And so I'm like, uh -huh, I'm, I'm a teacher sort of still. <laughs> Another question, how hard was it for your family to understand since they didn't come from a medical background, uh, understand that you were missing holidays and vacations and birthdays and yeah, they were um, they were understand they understood it though because they knew that it was something was important for me and they were like really wanted me you know they really always pushed education on me it was kind of funny you know during med school and always to be there with studying with a book and having my computer opening and I'd go to like they 
if my parents came to visit me in Houston and they'd be like, let's go see the Astros and I'd go with them, but I'd just sit with my book instead and, you know, be reading the whole time while they were watching the game. Um, and they just thought it was cute, I guess. I don't know. They're like, okay, she's reading. That's good. Uh, like that's what she does now. <laughs> All right, there's another question. I'm a Latina in mid thirties. Do you have any advice for non-traditional students interested in doing medicine? And that's like, yeah, go for it still. There's a lot of non-traditional students, you know, more and more in medicine. And like I said, some of the non-traditional ones are the best ones because they have different life experiences. I almost appreciate more non, like in, when people are going into residency, I appreciate more some of the non-traditional ones because they know what life is, they know what a job is, they know what hard work is, they've, um, you know, had different experiences. So I'm always like, yeah, don't give up on it. Um, you know, try to, you're gonna have to take your tests again. You're gonna have to roll, you know, work real hard to study for those, try to get some clinical experiences, but lean on like the experiences that you've had too. Cause that'll, you know, be respected by a lot of people. Um, I had a question. One of the um, specialties you listed as sort of one of the subspecialties of PMNR is dealing with the female athlete triad. And I, I'm an athlete, so we've heard a lot about that recently. And I was just wondering if there was, like, if you knew any more about that, if, like, in your area and how that's come about in the last little while. Yeah, so definitely a big thing. Now also it's called REDS. It's like relatively relative energy deficiency in sport. And um, like, uh, so I have some friends who they are, they specialize in it and they, you know, do sports medicine and they see athletes and do research on athletes who um, may have this triad, which is usually, you know, goes with kind of training a lot, decrease estrogen levels. So the athletes don't get their periods and then they, they're, without that estrogen, then their bones get thinner and then they get all the, the stress fractures and stuff a lot more easier. Um, it's just not good to not have your period either, believe it or not, or to be underweight and malnourished if you're trying to train for things. So yeah, so a lot of um, people in our specialty will, you know, are studying that, looking into it more and take care of athletes who have that usually, you know, as part of a team, because then you need someone who's a nutrition specialist or, and maybe a sports psychologist and, and someone also to help make sure that, um, you know, your hormones are right and your bones are right and you're on the right medication. So. Usually you work in a team. How big is your team um, when you have to, and then do you consult out or do you consult in as well? So, yeah, it just depends on the team that I'm in, um, what I'm doing at the time. So it's like if we're doing inpatient rehabilitation, then the team's really big because there's like several physical therapists, there's residents, there's, you know, occupational therapists, speech therapists, nurses, um, social workers, everything that work together in the inpatient to take care of the patients. If I'm in the outpatient, sometimes it's just me and my nurse, and then I'll send them to a physical therapist, whether that be in our facility or outside our facility, or it just depends on the specialist that I need, then, you know, we'll work together in taking care of patients who have long COVID. I work with like cardiologists and neurologists, probably the closest and with therapy. And so I would just like send to these doctors and these specialists as kind of what, depending on what the patient needs and we all work together. As an expert in long COVID, do you have any um, thoughts on its prevalence and how it's going to impact medicine moving forward? Yeah, so I think it's something like I say, like now you have to ask everyone if they've ever had COVID and like what happened to them after COVID, because I think oh, we're learning 
more is that there might still be like viral antigen persistence, like pieces of the virus that are left in people's bodies. They found like dormant in, in the GI tract and the gastrointestinal tract and in people's fat. And that might be activating the immune system and maybe causing autoimmune disease. Cause I think like now we know more and more about, like we're learning more and more about post-infectious diseases. Like okay, polio, people got polio and sick and some got better. And then actually like four decades later would get something called post polio where they started again, getting a lot of weakness and, um, and their muscles atrophying. But four decades later, we know that like hepatitis C causes liver cancer. We know that um, HPV causes cervical cancer. We, know, we now know that Epstein-Barr virus um, the virus that causes mono is now probably the number one cause of people who get multiple sclerosis. So like COVID, what's it going to cause? We still don't know. We know it's like doing this long COVID now, but what's it going to cause like decades from now? So that's kind of why I think it's going to be something that we have to know about from now on and really like be attentive to the needs of, or what's happening to people's bodies who've had COVID and who've had long COVID, I think like doctors are, you know, starting to realize like, I need to learn about post-viral conditions more and, and take care of patients who have things like dysautonomia or POTS. That's something that happens a lot after COVID. Um, you know, it's triggering autoimmune diseases. It's, it's triggering other diseases to become worse because of the endothelial dysfunction. Like even in kids, there's already been a huge number of kids who have developed type one diabetes after having COVID. And so like, this is just in the two or three years it's been here, what's gonna happen like years from now. And now that we're just letting it like rip and go wild, it's not good. So yeah, I still keep, you know, keep serious about COVID. question oh and then i also didn't say okay i forgot to an finish answering the question about covid and who is getting long covid so if you look at you know what the cdc says the cdc now um they have a survey that they've been releasing during the pandemic called the household pulse survey it's kind of like through the census and they more recently in the last few months started asking questions related to long covid and tracking the numbers. So now it seems something like one in five people have, who've had COVID have symptoms of long COVID or have ongoing issues related to COVID. So that's a lot, because if you think if there's like, you know, 90 million people who've had COVID is one in five, like 10 million people that could be suffering from COVID and maybe not everyone's disabled or anyone, everyone's out of work, but you know, is it headaches? Is it migraines? Is it blood pressure? Is it diabetes that's out of control? Is it pains? Is it concentration issues? Um, so that's something. And the other thing they found in that data is the age groups most at risk was 50 year old, 40 to 50 year old. So youngish people, um, women more than men, and then also Latinos, uh, Hispanic population get it the most too, have the high, about 9%. Yeah, I read a, a study that said uh, from the Labor, Department of Labor Statistics that 1 million people are not working because of long COVID. Or it's like actually maybe even more. Yeah, exactly, because of long COVID. Yeah. So it's... And you know, there's a, a crunch for workers everywhere. Yeah, you may you may want to end with COVID, but COVID's not done with us. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> she may, right. It's not. Yeah. The same thing the president said last week that oh, COVID's over, and um, and I had tweeted that. This is what happens when you have a lot of followers at this point. I had tweeted that COVID was a, that it was a slap in the face for him to say that because there was a lot of people still dealing with the effects of long COVID and suffering and not feeling like they had treatments or were getting benefits or getting dis disability or anything. And then I had like different reporters reach out to me. But then I was on NPR last weekend because I was talking about because of my tweet and because saying like, yes, people are still suffering. And so it's really not over. Um, so. I think what he meant was like the crisis or the whatever, the worst of it. People are not like clogging up. Although I'm still seeing patients come through the ER, but they're not. Um, 
as you know it wasn't as bad as it was like a year and a half ago but still yeah it's definitely like this is what's nice is that we have the treatments in the front like we have vaccines so not as many people are getting it as severe and not as many people are dying and we have like remdesivir and paxlovid and molnupiravir and these antivirals so people can get that early on if they're at risk and not get as sick there's still like a, over you know, a thousand, sometimes a couple of days ago, there were still a thousand people that died of COVID. Died, yeah. And so it's like, yeah, it's not the higher numbers than that, but it's still, you know, a fair amount of people. It's not a crisis, but it's still there. Yeah. No, it's still there. Um, like if it impacts your, you or your family, then it's still there. Yeah. And then also vaccination, I'm still recommending vaccines. I remember, recommend the booster, the new bivalent booster, please get it. Um, that also, if you're vaccinated, smaller risk of getting long COVID, definitely less risk of dying or getting severe disease also. Yeah. Well, um, it's 6.30 and it's 8.30 your time. So we should probably let you go. Thank you again for for coming no and making yourself available. Yeah. And uh, I just texted Michael and I said, "Hey, our speaker is wearing your T-shirt." I know. Put a smiley face. Here, let me take a picture. Yeah, take a picture. Let me. I'm gonna send it to him because he sent the smiley face. Yeah. Can you lower it just a little bit? There. I know. Yeah. Let's do that. There you go. <laughs> All right, I'm going to send it to him, so. Yeah. He would be excited. Yes, exactly. I'm representing. <laughs> All righty. Well, thank you again. Tomorrow, but <laughs> it's the day I get seen more, so. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you again for making time, and I know that... <laughs>